Καλησπέρα σε όλους. Ε, σήμερα, σε αυτή, την, σε αυτή την παρουσίαση που πρόκειται να ακολουθήσει, έχω τη χαρά να... να, να, να πω, κάνει... στα, στα αγγλικά, στα αγγλικά, στα αγγλικά. I'm sorry. Uh, and, uh, this is the, the, a, a translation seminar of the HEAD, and I uh, have the opportunity to, to introduce my colleague, Panos Alexopoulos. Panos Alexopoulos is a very, very prominent uh, colleague. He's, uh, in the, he, he works at the University of Patras. Uh, he, he's an associate professor of psychiatry. And um, the presentation that uh, we'll give to us is uh, if depressive symptoms contribute to the diagnosis of neurocognitive disorders. Professor Alexopoulos. Many thanks, uh, Professor Politis, for the introduction and for giving me this golden opportunity to talk today about the results of our study regarding uh, the potential utility of uh, depressive symptoms in identifying neurocognitive disorders. Uh, let me share, okay, my presentation. Okay, so, um, as we all know, the depressive symptom, the depressive syndrome is not uh, only characterized by cognitive deficits or difficulties in activities of daily living, but it also includes neuropsychiatric symptoms, or another term which is uh, used for these symptoms is non-cognitive non -cognitive, uh, symptoms. And uh, non-cognitive symptom, uh, sim symptoms include symptoms like anxiety, sleep disorder, irritability, appetite disorder, delusion. One of the most uh, common non-cognitive um, non symptoms of uh, the dementia syndrome is depression. Its prevalence exceeds 40% uh, percent in, uh, in the dementia uh, syndrome. And uh, depression is also relatively common in individuals with mild cognitive impairment. Mild cognitive impairment is another clinical uh, syndrome which is characterized by cognitive deficits, which are not so severe that... Uh, activities performance in activities of daily living is significantly impaired. Um, in MCI, in individuals with mild cognitive impairment, depressive symptoms are also relatively uh, common. For instance, um, studies which are community-based point to a prevalence of uh, depressive symptoms, which is between 25 and uh, 30 uh, and 30 percent, percent while uh, in the while studies which are clinic based point to even higher prevalence of depressive symptoms in individuals with mild cognitive impairment. According to such uh, clinic based uh, studies, the prevalence is of depressive symptoms in MCI is approximately 40 percent. So there is a coexistence or co-occurrence of depressive symptoms and dementia symptoms. What is really interesting is the fact that it seems that depressive symptoms are also related to aspects of the pathomechanism of Alzheimer's disease, or more generally speaking, with, uh, with the pathomechanism, the relationship, there are relationships with the pathomechanism of dementia. For instance, we all know that uh, the presence of the epsilon-4 allele of the apolipoprotein epsilon gene is the most important genetic risk factor for the development of Alzheimer's disease. There is mounting evidence pointing to the role of carrying the epsilon-4 allele of the apolipoprotein epsilon gene for increasing the risk for developing not only, not only dementia, but also depressive symptoms or depression in the absence of cognitive impairment. So epsilon-4 allele is not only associated with an increased risk for the development of dementia, but also for the development of depressive symptoms and depression in the absence of dementia, uh, of dementia, uh, of the dementia syndrome. 
There is also another very interesting and more recent uh, study which points to the role of amyloid uh, load in brain in individuals who suffer from depressive uh, who suffer from depressive uh, symptoms. So, according to this, uh, to the findings of this relatively recent uh, study, individuals who do not suffer from cognitive impairment, who do not suffer from dementia or mild cognitive impairment, but who suffer from depressive symptoms, they do have increased amyloid load in their brain. And simultaneously, of course, of course, decreased levels of uh, the serotonin transporter compared to older individuals, age and sex matched, who do not suffer from uh, depressive symptoms. And the higher the ratio of amyloid load to serotonin transporter levels, the more severe the symptoms of depression. So you can we can see that there is a clear association between aspects of the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease and the presence of depressive symptoms. There are different tools available with which we can assess the presence of depressive uh, symptoms. One of them is the geriatric depression scale. There are different versions of it. There, of it. there is uh, a longer one. And there is also a short one, a brief one, the geriatric depression scale, which includes uh, 15 items. This version of geriatric depression scale has been validated in a Greek cohort. And, uh, there, and uh, total, the total scores of the geriatric depression scale can point to the options of depressive symptoms and they can also enter scores higher than five points point to the presence of uh, depression of different uh, severity, uh, severity decrease. All these data which point to the co-occurrence, to the co-manifestation of depressive symptoms and dementia symptoms, as well as these, the, as well as the data which indicate uh, an association between the occurrence of depressive symptoms and aspects of uh, the AD pathogenesis has have motivated us to try to answer the question if depressive symptoms can be helpful in detecting dementia or mild cognitive impairment. In order to answer this question, we conducted analysis in two different cohorts. The one cohort was a, was a Greek cohort, um, which uh, is a university, which is university hospital based. And the second cohort is a German one, which is a primary healthcare based cohort. Uh, by conducting uh, analysis in both cohorts, uh, we could answer the question if the potential utility of depressive symptoms in diagnosing uh, dementia and mild cognitive impairment is specific uh, for one for the setting of university hospital uh, diagnostic workup, or if it is more universal and it can and, and depressive symptoms can also be helpful in uh, the primary healthcare setting. The Greek cohort uh, was uh, mainly is mainly based on individuals recruited within the frames of uh, the Hellenic Longitudinal Investigation of Aging and uh, Diet Study, which is a population uh, study coordinated by Professor Ascarmeas from the University of uh, Athens. It includes individuals, older individuals uh, who live in uh, Larissa, in the city of Larissa, and in the, in the, the area of Marusi in uh, Attica. Um, this, uh, the Heliot, uh, the Heliot uh, participants who, who, are, who are included in our study uh, were 241 individuals suffering from mild cognitive impairment and 96 individuals suffering from AD dementia. In order to enrich the Greek cohort with patients, both MCI and dementia, we also included patients of two university hospital-based uh, psychogeriatric units, mainly 
of uh, the unit of at the Aginitium Hospital and at the University Hospital of Patras, who is available to all participants of the Greek of the Greek cohort have available data of geriatric depression scale and mini mental state examination. And here we can see the different groups of uh, the Greek cohort. Uh, we, the Greek cohort included 1,816 individuals without cognitive impairment, 349 individuals suffering from mild cognitive impairment, and 147 individuals suffering from dementia due to Alzheimer's disease of note. Diagnoses were established after a thorough diagnostic workup, which included an extensive neuropsychological assessment of all uh, included individ individuals. With regard to our analytical um, analytical uh, strategy, the geriatric depression scale uh, scale items were analyzed uh, uh, by. Uh, based on uh, on a method which is called ensemble learning method is it is a machine learning technique which includes multiple learning algorithms so that the predictive performance of the technique is uh, is uh, maximized um i have to underscore uh, here that this uh, that, that all the uh, that all the analysis were performed by uh, by the computer scientists and statisticians, members of our research team. Uh, the clinical diagnosis served as the gold standard, and we compare the results of the machine learning technique to the results of the mini mental state examination. Uh, we all know from our clinical practice that uh, scores on the mini mental ranging between 28 and 30 points are in general, in most cases, compatible with, with the, the options of cognitive impairment, while scores uh, ranging between 24 and 27 points are compatible with mild cognitive impairment, while scores um, lower than 24 points point, generally speaking, uh, to the presence of uh, dementia. 80% uh, of uh, the cases were used uh, to train uh, the machine learning technique, and then the rest of uh, the cases were used for the validation of uh, the machine learning of the model which uh, was uh, which had been had been uh, developed. Here we can uh, see uh, the findings. Here are the findings based on the, on the machine learning uh, technique. Here are the predictions of the technique. And here are the diagnoses. We can see uh, the diagnosis, the clinical uh, diagnosis, which uh, are based on a thorough um, assessment of uh, the included uh, individuals. Of note, the machine learning technique was, was very effective in correctly uh, classifying individuals without cognitive impairment. You can see here that the, prior, that the specificity was excellent, while the sensitivity of the machine learning technique was not so, was not, was not high, and uh, the, the machine learning technique failed incorrectly, in most cases, incorrectly classifying, uh, classifying the individuals with both MCI and uh, or AD or AD uh, dementia. If age, sex, and education are taken into account, then the accuracy increases and reaches 88%. Uh, percent. When these data are compared to uh, the findings based on uh, the performance of the mini mental state examination, we can see that the accuracy of, uh, of uh, the mini mental state examination as expected is uh, significantly lower compared to the accuracy of, uh, of uh, the machine learning technique. What actually, what is actually the advantage of this machine learning, uh, of this machine learning technique? The advantage is that uh, somehow the different items are treated differentially uh, according to their importance in predicting the and in correctly classifying the individuals, which means that uh, different weights are assigned to the different uh, to the different uh, items of uh, the geriatric depression scale. Uh, fueled by these positive 
uh, findings in this, in the Greek cohort, which is a university hospital-based uh, cohort, we uh, tried to um, assess if the, if, uh, the geriatric depression scale items, if depressive symptoms can also be useful in detecting uh, dementia in a, co in, in a primary healthcare uh, setting. Uh, we analyzed data of the ESTER study. The ESTER study is a population uh, study uh, which takes, still takes uh, place in the federal state of uh, Saarland in Western uh, Germany. And it is, um, it is a population-based uh, study in which general practitioners are very crucially involved. The diagnosis are, are the di they are uh, the, uh, the the members of the research team who are recruit, they in the, who recruit the participants and, and the assessments are mainly based on, uh, on their efforts. Um, more than 2,500 2, individual members of uh, in the participants of uh, the ESTER study had available geriatric depression scale data and were older than 64 years. They were included in our analysis, and uh, here we can uh, see um, the, the two uh, groups who each were included in the analysis with regarding uh, the efficiency of uh, depressive symptoms in detecting dementia in a primary healthcare setting. Uh, the, the German cohort included 2,566 2, individuals without dementia and 211 individuals with dementia, which means it is really important to clarify it, that these patients at the time point of the collection of the geriatric depression scale data, they suffered from dementia or they developed dementia within uh, within nine years, within a follow-up period of uh, nine years, while individuals who are treated as not suffering from dementia were individuals, individuals who did not suffer from dementia at the time point of their assessment with the geriatric depression scale or who did not uh, develop dementia within a follow-up period of nine, of nine years. Uh, as in the Greek uh, cohort, 80% of uh, the cases were used for craning the machine learning technique and uh, the algorithm and 20% of the cases were used for uh, the validation of uh, the algorithm. Uh, here we can see uh, the findings. Uh, again, in the, German, in the German cohort, in the primary healthcare-based uh, uh, cohort, the algorithm was, the, was excellent in correctly classifying individuals without cognitive impairment. While here in this uh, setting, the sensitivity was not so high, but it was clearly higher compared to the Greek uh, cohort. The accuracy uh, was 92%, uh, percent, and if age, sex, and education are also taken into account, then it rockets to 97%. Uh, 97%. In conclusion, we can uh, mention that uh, that uh, depression symptoms uh, may uh, assist uh, dementia diagnostic uh, workup. Um, it is of paramount importance, in my opinion, that the geriatric depression scale is a self-rating depression scale, which is which means that uh, it can be easily completed even in the waiting room of healthcare facilities, uh, which is. For the feasibility and for the dire and for and for uh, the way the primary healthcare settings, but also the university-based, uh, the university hospital-based settings, uh, do currently work. It's of paramount. It is of paramount importance to have tools. Importance to have tools to uh, to complete the diagnostic workup relatively quickly. Uh, it seems that. Uh, that uh, depressive symptoms can I then can distinguish between uh, individual older adults without cognitive impairment and those with uh, and those with uh, cognitive impairment with relatively high 
specificity, the sensitivity is, uh, not, is not high, it's relatively low. Uh, before final conclusions can be drawn, it is important to replicate these findings in independent uh, cohorts and uh, in cohorts which will include higher number of patients. One of the uh, shortcomings of these analyses is that, uh, is that uh, the numbers of uh, patients are relatively low. And uh, before final conclusions can be drawn, it is also very important that uh, the findings are replicated, but in this uh, based on different depression instruments and not only on geriatric uh, depression scale. So many thanks uh, for your attention. I would like here to, to thank um, all the members of uh, our team, particularly the computer scientists and the, stat and the statisticians. Without their support, this analysis would not have been uh, possible. I would also uh, like to express my gratitude to the members of the Esther team, of the Helia team, and also uh, to the clinicians of uh, the old age psychiatry outpatient uh, clinics uh, who have uh, recru who, who have recruited uh, the, the individuals um, for uh, this uh, analysis. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you, Professor Alexopoulos, for this uh, interesting study with the new data uh, that tried to, to clarify the relationship between uh, dementia and depression and dementia and uh, the role of uh, depression in, in uh, developing uh, dementia. We try to, to understand if uh, we can uh, predict uh, the, the dementia occurrence in, uh, in patients with uh, the patient. Well, can we open the discussion now with my excellent colleagues? Do you have any questions to Professor Alexopoulos? I could ask. So uh, thanks, Panos. Really great presentation and really amazing data for us. We are non-clinicians uh, and we believe in the connection between depression and Alzheimer. Uh, from the molecular, let's say, biological base of it, the neurobiological base of it. That's very uh, good support of what we are trying to, to, to understand on the molecular basis. And where, because you are putting the, you know, as clinicians who see the patients, you are putting the questions, we're trying to find answers or connections or targeted, let's say, suggested targets. So, so geriatric depression scale, you're using it only this, or or you need other also tools in the general screening you're doing. I know in this study it was just uh, G, uh, G, uh, GP, GTS, but in general, uh, and probably that also for Professor Politis to answer, both of you, uh, you're using only this one is enough, or you're using a broader, you know, anxiety or depression related scales to see in a daily basis your patients and you do it because it's a protocol or you are doing because you think you need extra sensitivity or extra details for hence in all the neuropsychiatric component of the upcoming probably dementia. May I answer, uh, Professor Politis, may I answer the, the question? Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Many thanks, uh, Yanis, many thanks for this uh, interesting uh, question, which is uh, very relative actually for our clinical practice. Uh, we do not use only uh, the geriatric depression uh, scale in our clinical in our clinical practice. We do also use the neuropsychiatric inventory, uh, and we do and we try to assess and uh, try to assess the neuropsychiatric symptoms, the non-cognitive symptoms of uh, dementia, because uh, they are, in my opinion, they are a crucial pillar in the diagnostic workup of uh, dementia, not only, for not only for the diagnosis, but also for, the su for supporting both the patient and, uh, and his or her care, care, caregiver in his and, and his and her uh, family. So what we, in our practice, we use the geriatric depression scale uh, and uh, the neuropsychiatric inventory. The advantage of the geriatric depression scale compared to other scales, depression scales, which are specific for dementia is that, uh, or for, for assessing depressive symptoms 
when the dementia syndrome has already been uh, diagnosed is that the geriatric depression scale covers also individuals with mild cognitive impairment plus individuals who, to, who have not uh, developed uh, dementia, but they come to our clinic, to, to, to our, uh, they come to the hospital, to the, to the outpatient uh, clinic because of anxiety and because of uh, depressive symptoms in the absence of cognitive impairment. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Professor Bach. Yes, Maria. Ah, okay, sorry. So, Paul, congratulations uh, for the excellent presentation and for this uh, interesting way of seeing things using machine learning. It's very, very sophisticated way of analyzing data. Um, and um, your whole group, of course, so everyone who contributes in the study. So I, if I get it right, you suggest that you can use depressive symptoms to to set a diagnosis for, for uh, cognitive disorders, correct? Or, or Actually, the, di the diagnosis can only be established by the clinician, yeah. by the physician, by the psychiatrist, by the neurologist, by the geriatricians. This is a tool which can help clinicians to detect, to identify the presence of cognitive impairment. Okay, so I think it, it, to me, being a clinician, it makes a lot of sense because I believe that uh, depression and uh, cognitive disorders have uh, share many common underlying mechanisms. For example, neuroinflammation is present in both uh, disorders. So uh, I think that uh, the, I mean, the, the way you saw it is uh, very logical and um, it makes sense. And I would think that the other way around would, would also make sense. So meaning that uh, uh, finding cognitive uh, problems in someone who is depressed is going to, to help with the diagnosis. And um, because I think it's a, a bi-directional association. So these are cross-sectional uh, data, correct? If I get uh, you analyzed. Yes, yes. So it means that if somebody is cognitively impaired and he becomes, he may become more depressed and on the other way, depressed people are, uh, have a cognitive deficit. So you can't really say what comes first and what follows but there seems to be such an association. So maybe you could also see it the other way around. Uh, but congratulations, I really liked it. And we could uh, uh, verify your findings uh, with our database from the Creta Nation Cofer, because we do use uh, the HAD scale as well. And we have all the clinical and uh, um, clinical um, diagnosis for both for depression and for uh, cognitive uh, disorders. Maria, just uh, in order to be sure that I have correctly understood you, uh, you use in the in your epidemiological study, you do not you, you do not use geriatric depression scale, no, but the HADS, no. right? No, oh, okay, do. both, yes, both, yeah. both mm -hmm. HADS and geriatric depression scale. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it is a source of data for a for, for replication study. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. Yes, thank, yes. You. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But I think that the bottom line is that we need to treat both. That's a good uh, way of seeing it for clinicians. Ah, uh, no. Is there any other question? So, I, I, it might be so, uh, not, okay. I, I wonder why you, you choose the machine learning uh, technique uh, as a, a, a way to, to, to examine this, uh, this data and not to, to follow 
the, a, a very known path about uh, statistical analysis and all this. Uh, it, I think that uh, I can I can totally follow and understand your question. Um, it does not work if we just uh, try to differentiate uh, between individuals without cognitive impairment and individuals with older adults with uh, cognitive impairment just relying on the total score. It does not work. The interrelation, the interrelations between the cognitive, between the different items of the GDS are very complex if we would like to use this information for detecting, uh, for, detect, uh, for detecting cognitive impairment. Even we have tried the initial, our, within the frames of our initial analysis, we tried to replicate the findings of the Greek cohort in the German cohort. But there, the way the GDS is completed, was completed in Germany compared to the way the GDS was completed in Greece is totally different. And uh, we have conducted analysis to show this difference. Uh, so it is not so easy uh, to, to interpret uh, to interpret the GDS as total score. It is not useful, the total score for identifying cognitive impairment. Uh, the relation, if we, if, we, if we would like to use GDS as a tool for identifying cognitive impairment in older adults, we have to consider and to take into account that the relationships between the GDS items are very, very complex. And uh, we have to use more sophisticated methods. I was not aware of, the, of this fact, but through the analysis and even the machine learning technique, which uh, was used in our analysis, is, belongs to the most sophisticated. So, so, so we need more, more sophisticated uh, techniques in order to, to understand, to, to, to take into consideration the items, that, so to do, that the items are very important in order to, to evaluate the, the differences between the two groups. So this is very important information, not to take into consideration the, the total score. And uh, I, I think in your presentation, this is very, very uh, interesting, very prominent for, for the clinicians and not only. Did you try specific items to see if they are more predictive from the, from the scale, like sleep disorders or uh, emotion? The problem with the geriatric depression scale as a tool is that somehow uh, it, does not, it does not cover the whole spectrum of depressive symptoms uh, which manifest in, in, in older adults. This is the problem. And uh, another uh, fact is that many of the items are somehow interrelated. Uh, but simultaneously, the way the items are completed differentiate between different communities and between individuals with different backgrounds. So it is really complex and I don't know if such an analysis would be more universally valid. I, I, am, I am worried that such, a valid, that such an analysis would be, would be effective in a very small number of patients, but not in larger groups. I think another issue that is very important is this uh, different performance for, for the two groups, the Greek and the German some. And uh, sometimes there is the, the question, or we have to be aware who is going to, uh, to, to, to work with the GDS, to, to, um, for this, to, okay. You understand to who will yeah, uh, yeah, at, at which setting at which setting the GDS will be completed. Um, I totally agree. Um, com if we compare the two settings, 
in the Greek in the Greek uh, cohort, the assessment of each individual was at a specific time point more thorough compared to the German cohort. Mm -hmm. On the other side, the 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 diagnosis the, 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 the diagnosis uh, in the German co cohort were established by by the GPs, and not in all cases a mini mental state examination was performed or a clock drawing test. But in the German cohort, the assessment was uh, the assessment covered a more wide time frame because the general practitioner, a practitioner is in the position to assess and to follow up the patient many times. It was, it was something which was not expected uh, by me that uh, the accuracy of the machine learning technique would be higher in the German cohort compared to the Greek cohort because the Greek cohort was uh, collected and was uh, assessed within the frames of a university hospital based uh, setting. But somehow it seems that the general practitioners, even they do not use very detailed, very thorough cognitive assessments, but they are in the position to be uh, to be very accurate in their diagnosis in their diagnosis because they have the advantage of following up the patients uh, many times. And I think that this is also a very fine a very interesting finding of the of these analysis. Thanks. And my last question for me, and there is the concept of the MBR, you know, the mild behavior impairment that is coming before the dementia, like the MCI. And it's, we have to, to discuss uh, what are the group of the patients, the, the group of patients that with depression that belongs to this group of the MBI. Uh, of the of the MBI. Um, and if this work that you are doing now would give uh, at last information of, of, of possible uh, MBI patients with depression. You understand when depression is an MBI symptom and not always depression is an MBI symptom. Of course, depression cannot. We have to. We have to. I think that we have to differ, to differentiate. I was very careful with the terms which I used uh, in my presentation. I, I did not uh, refer to uh, depression. I did not refer to depressive uh, syndrome. I did not uh, refer to MBI. I did exclusively refer to depressive symptoms because depressive symptoms are not always sufficient for for establishing the diagnosis of a major depression or of a depressive uh, syndrome or of, or of MBI. So uh, I was really careful because uh, the geriatric depression scale is just a tool. As I have already mentioned, uh, MBI or the clinical diagnosis of a depression is, they, is can only, they can only be established by a clinician. So we, we have a work to do with this, uh, uh, with, with depressive symptoms. And we have to work more on, on these uh, items and to, to try not to take into consideration the total score of the, of the scales. We have to work uh, very carefully on the specific items and uh, try to understand uh, our patients for their clinical phenotype. It's very important to, for, for, for their future uh, uh, risk of uh, developing uh, possible neurocognitive disorder. I think this is the, the, the point that we present, and this is very important because usually the most of us we take in consideration the total score, you know, the total score of GDS, it's mild, moderate, severe depression. But the problem is not the total score, is try to identify the, the possible phenotypes that uh, are uh, uh, in this GDS group. It's difficult, but I think you did the first steps to this uh, direction. Any other comment? Any other uh, suggestion for the future?
Okay. If there is no any other question, uh, any comment? We have to thank Professor Alexopoulos for this interesting data and results. The first steps in order to understand this continuity between depression and uh, depressive symptoms and uh, neurocognitive uh, disorders. And uh, thank you all of you. You were with us, Professor Abramopoulos. And uh, thanks, Dimitris, you, are, you were with us. And, uh, Sonia Pola for your getting <laughs> the uh, Professor Sotiropoulos, Professor Basta, thank you all of you who you were with us. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you and good luck with the thing. Thank you. <laughs> so bad. Okay, goodbye to everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.